Fashion time, and Jody is here. Hello, good who's, morning. Who's just said uh, all? She has three brothers, and they all have the same face. We all, there's four, <laughs> all of four of us. you. Yeah, we all look exactly all, the same. All look exactly the same. Yeah. There's Jack, who's decided that he just what was it that you were basically. Well, I, I was I was taken from the wrong bed. I don't look <laughs> like my family, you see. And my brother and I, we we genuinely don't look related at all. Weirdly, there was a boy called Zach at my school with the same surname oh. who did look like There's me. Jack and Zach so that Pepper. was I know, Stop I know. It. What and you look the same and we you look didn't the same, but we're not suspicious. related. No, <laughs> that is so weird. I'm on the case. <laughs> this is really, you're on something. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and ordinary Mark is here yes. as well, who, who just is normal. Very ordinary today. Uh, <laughs> Jack and Zach sounds like a great pop band, though. Yeah, it? it does. Uh, so we'll be taking requests, by the way, after midday, but you can call from 11.30. Is it Jody or is it Jack on the phones today? It's me. It's Jody. Lucky okay, you. so all, all the Jack fans are going to have to wait. <laughs> so uh, we'll take your request. You call from uh, 11.30, but meantime, we have some business. This time tomorrow, by the way, uh, Captain Scala. Uh, we're going to be announcing the first person who's going to be Captain Scala for the day and gets the right to call themselves Captain Scala for 24 hours and, and gets the mug. Meantime, it's a confession, and this one comes from Sean. Thank you, Sean. Father Simon and the Forgiving Few, that's you. Back in my school days, I was a chorister from the age of 8 to 13. My guess is that Jack was a chorister. No, actually. Oh. No, no. My guess is that Jodie wasn't a chorister. Ah, oh, I was in the chamber choir. How, yeah, got how that. wrong you were, <laughs> Zero Simon. out of two. And Mark has been in a choir. <laughs> I have a voice that sounds like a baboon. Very good. <laughs> As you might know, being a chorister requires a lot of commitment and a lot of time spent before, during and after school rehearsing and performing. Amongst the regular services of Choral Even Song and the annual performance of The Messiah, we had other one-off performances booked throughout the year, and it's at one of these performances that this confession takes place. I was 12 years old. It was just before the start of the summer holidays and our choir master, Mr. Topper, I've changed all the names, by the way, had helped organise a concert of choral classics as part of a week-long festival at a large and very grand spa building. Built in the early 19th century, its main hall, beautiful high dome ceiling and a third-floor balcony that goes all the way around the room and the front of the building leads out to a large lawn of well-manicured grass. The number of people going, I know precisely where this is because you've described it, so therefore dropping the name of the place was a waste of time. That Saturday was a beautiful summer's day, and as we all arrived in our school uniform for the first rehearsal at 11am, we all agreed that we'd much rather be out in the sun playing on the lawn than spending our Saturday stuck inside rehearsing. Well, we were rehearsed until 12.30, when we were all escorted to a large room on the third floor by the Choral Scholar, a young man just out of school who had the unenviable task of keeping track of 18 energetic schoolboys. Meanwhile, Mr. Topper stayed downstairs to talk to the organiser of the festival who had sat in on our rehearsal. We all got given our packed lunch of a sandwich, a piece of fruit and a carton of juice, which we promptly finished in a few minutes, leaving us with the best part of an hour to entertain ourselves. Myself and three other friends... I'm going to call them Barry, Robin and Morris, managed to sneak... Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that Barry, Robin and Morris, but, you know, it just works. Managed to sneak out of the room when the choral scholar was preoccupied with an argument about who took the last apple juice, and we managed to get onto the balcony undetected. We peered over the edge and we saw Mr Topper below us, having a cup of tea and chatting with the festival director. Now, both Barry and Robin were 13 and the most senior choristers, but Barry was the real troublemaker of the group. He was the first one to suggest that we drop something from the balcony onto the choir master below. Can I just say at the beginning of this, obviously, never try anything like any of these things at home because it would be a really, really <laughs> daft and stupid thing to do. We all made suggestions ranging from pocket fluff up to a shoe. Now, we ruled out... <laughs> Anything that could link back to us, and despite him often shouting at us during rehearsals, we didn't want to be bad boys. We tried dropping bits of pocket fluff and small bits of paper, but there was a slight breeze and they kept getting blown off course. We all ran around the balcony looking for something, and I stumbled upon a squash ball. Quite what it was doing in the balcony, no one has any idea. We all converged above Mr Topper, and I gave the squash ball to Barry for him to drop over the edge. No, 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 you found it. You should be the one to drop it, he replied thrusting it back into my hand. Really? Hmm. It's got to be you. Make it count. You've only got one chance. Well, I wasn't sure, but I was encouraged by Morris and Barry. It'll be really funny, they assured me. Well, the pressure got to me without looking. I held the squash ball out over the balcony edge and I let go. 
As soon as it was released, we all rushed and peered over the edge, watching, watching it tumble through the air perfectly on course for Mr. Topper. It seemed to fall in slow motion until it finally landed with full force in Mr. Topper's cup of tea. <laughs> oh, no. What a splash. As soon as, as soon as we had splashed down, we all immediately recoiled from the balcony edge and heard the startled <laughs> cries from both men below. We took a beat, looked at each other, sprinted back to the room to sneak back in and join the other boys as if we'd been there the whole time. We'd only be gone for ten minutes and the choral scholar was still preoccupied with Juice Gate and hadn't noticed a thing. Thirty seconds later, a furious Mr. Topper burst in. His white shirt drenched and his face <laughs> purply red with rage who was it he spat at the group his mug of tea trembling in his hand who was what sir piped up barry a false look of concern lighting his face oh i knew it would be you replied mr topper striding towards barry i haven't done anything sir i've been here the whole time <laughs> protested barry with some conviction standing his ground with the enraged choir master towering over him it's true, I confirmed. He's been here the whole time. Mr. Topper turned to the choral scholar who was visibly confused. Is there anyone missing? Did anyone leave at any point? He snapped at the young man. Uh, uh, no, replied the clearly nervous choral scholar, hoping not to be on the receiving end of a classic Mr. Topper burst of outrage. Somebody dropped this from the balcony. He produced the offending squash ball from his mug. <laughs> I am drenched. <laughs> It looked as if he'd been hit by a tea bomb. His shirt was brown, his hair was still dripping. Spiffing shot, huh? And unless someone tells me who it was, you will not be allowed outside until the concert is finished. You will all stay in this room for the entirety of your break. The room was completely silent. No one said anything. We all just looked at each other. A few of the other boys had seen the small group of us sneak in and out. They remained silent. Until one of you confesses, you will all be punished. Classic teaching line. You have embarrassed me and the choir's reputation, and he stormed out loudly, shutting the door. I never did confess, and no one ratted me out. So we spent our sunny afternoon sat indoors. As I recall, the concert went well, and I believe the choir has been invited back. But I need forgiveness, not from Mr. Topper, who often threw pencils at us during rehearsals. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So deserved it. Not from my peers, the other boys who missed their time outside the sun, in the sun because of me on a glorious Saturday afternoon. I seek forgiveness from the poor choral scholar who had to spend an extra hour and a half cooped up in a room with 18 boys with too much energy, uh, none of whom wanted to be there. Yours repentantly, Sean. I suspect that there are many choral confessions, but we'll find out in, in the fullness of time. Jody, former chorister herself, former then chorister. speaks with wisdom. Well, Sean, I think... You gave in to peer pressure, an older boy persuaded you to throw the squash ball. Yes. And I've got to celebrate your aim is mm. Mm. amazing. Unless he was aiming for, uh, yeah. for the teacher's Landing head. right in the tee. And I remember once I gave in to peer pressure, like you, a boy at my desk asked me to fling a bit of rubber at the teacher's board and it landed right on top of her head. Very similar situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to forgive you because I know the horror you must have felt and... Boys probably didn't mind staying cooped up. You probably just played a game or two. So, <laughs> so forgiveness from Jody. What about Jack? Well, Mr. Topper's come a cropper. Has oh, 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 oh. Does anybody else see the irony of it being a squash ball and he's called Mr. Topper? You know, this is the thing that's landed in, in, his, in his mouth. <laughs> no. The thing that the, the thing that I struggle with is that the squash ball fell in his tea and it ruined a perfectly good cuppa. That's what I mm. find challenging. I'm a teapot, so any kind of cuppa that's been ruined by something like that is, for me, unforgivable. Okay. So I'm afraid I can't So never forgive. mind the teacher, it's just what happened to the cup of tea. Yes. Jack. Mark. <laughs> uh, the man threw pencils at people? No. I mean, it's a, a, a complete forgiveness. Brilliant aim, fantastic idea. D gave into peer pressure. I've just got the mental image of the Bee Gees stood up there doing it. So, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's with me forever. So, that's fine. <laughs> Forgive them. Good old Barry, Robin, and Morris. Okay. Uh, if you would like to have your say on Sean's confession, on the text, please, 64100. The first word has to be Scala. You're very kind. That's true. Okay, so this is our this is our first ever Captain Scala. So we'll go back to the confessions later in the week. But this is an idea is just to kind of acknowledge someone who has done some fine work. And maybe you've said thank you, but maybe the rest of us need to know about it. It doesn't need to be an extraordinary performance, you know. It just needs to be a nice little thing that deserves acknowledgement. A little round of applause. Got this email. Thank you very much for all the emails. 
Uh, loads coming in. Simon at scarlaradio.co.uk. Emma Rollin in Belper. I would like to nominate my lovely husband James for Captain Scala this week. I've had a weird fluey virus and he's kept the household going, including our two children, Tom and Nancy, taking them to school while I've pottered around in pyjamas, something I'm not proud of. He's also made sure I kept hydrated and took all my meds, even did the cleaning. He's pretty brilliant most of the time, but this week he's been even brillianter. Thank you, says Emma. And this is Captain Scala. He'll be James Rollin. Hello, James. Hi, Simon. Hello. You're Captain Scala for the day. Yes, what what an honour. What a, what a great honour. And the first one as well. <laughs> the first one, it, it means that you're indestructible for at least 24 hours. Although, don't put that to the <laughs> test, obviously. I won't. I won't. So, for, first of all, how's Emma doing? She's much better, thanks, Simon. Yeah, it was one of those weird things where it was a bit of a cold, but it sort of completely laid her flat and knocked her out for a few days. Yes. But she's better now, much better now, thanks. I think pretty much back to full health. Okay, that's very good. So uh, did you have to sort of change your work day at all? Uh, well, fortunately, my, my situation means I can be pretty flexible at, at, at the present time, so, yeah. so I could sort of uh, work around it and do the school runs and, and, and the, the, the weekly shop and all that sort of stuff. So, so we, we were able to work around it. it. It was fairly okay to adapt, let's say. And you've even done the cleaning. The, the impression, I think, there is, you know, that's quite a remarkable thing. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I, I think I do my fair share most of the time. Do so, you? Uh, do you? I see. I see. But now your your share suddenly increased somewhat. Yes. Yes. It did. It did this last week. Yes. So basically, <laughs> it just meant. Basically, it just meant you did everything. Uh, more or less for a few days. Yes, I was sort of uh, chief cook and, and, and bottle washer and uh, uh, a cleaner and uh, wiki shopper and all that sort of thing for for a few days. Yeah. So I, I wonder if a number of people might be saying that's probably just what Emma does on a daily basis, and you just had to step up for a couple of days. Well, some <laughs> some may put it like that, Simon. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> are things and are things back to normal? Is is she still pottering around in pajamas, or is she is she stopped doing that? No, no, she's 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 back up and about, and yes, I think we're all back to normal now. Well, I think we're all uh, we're all glad to say. <laughs> Good. Well, it's it's very nice talking to you, and uh, congratulations on being our first captain, Scala. We'll send you a mug. I, I imagine we have all your details, but um, if you don't hang on the line, but you are captain, Scala. You're our first captain, Scala, uh, and and for that reason, James will always remember you. Well, thank you, Simon, and and uh, thank you. Uh, it's good to hear you back on the radio. We've been big fans of yours for a long while, and it's it's great to have you back uh, broadcasting uh, to the nation once again. Well, that's very kind. Can I just say you don't have to say that at the end of Cap- every Captain Scarlet, in case you're wondering. But anyway, uh, but that was it's a very nice message, and James, thank you very much indeed. Uh, congrats on being Captain Scarlet. We'll send you a mug, and I hope uh, Emma continues to get better, and Tom and Nancy realise what a cool dad they've got. <laughs> All right, thanks, Simon. Uh, thanks, all the best to you and all the best to you and the team. Thank you. World on you, says Captain Scala. <laughs> if you know someone, oh yes, if you know someone who deserves to be Captain Scala for the day, Simon at scalaradio.co.uk. Captain Scala. Because you're George Lucas, you can get the idea away. So we've got this idea, we, the Ark of a Covenant, it's going to go missing. The Nazis have taken it. What do you think? Okay, fine. Hey, but what a great movie. So here we go, it's 11.16, and let's unveil another Captain Scarlet. And an email from Barbara Dumbleton. Uh, Simon, first I must tell you how much I love Scarlet Radio, and you show, etc, etc, etc. I would like to nominate my daughter Gemma Loftus for Captain Scarlet for the day. Gemma is a single mum with two young children and a mortgage. She was made redundant at the beginning of February. It was a dreadful shock to us all and especially worrying for her. Uh, But instead of feeling sorry for herself and sinking into despair, she set about sending out her CV and applying for jobs. She stayed upbeat and optimistic throughout this difficult and worrying time. On Wednesday of this week, she was rewarded for her perseverance when driving home from an interview for a job at Bart and Stacey near Andover. They know who they are. She received a telephone call telling her that they were offering her the job. She is absolutely ecstatic, as are everyone in the family. I know she'd be a credit to the company, and they will not be disappointed. Thank you again for the show, and I think Gemma should be Captain Scala. And here is the aforementioned 
Gemma Loftus, who is Captain Scala for the day. Hello, Gemma. Hi, good morning, Simon. Hello. How are you? I, I'm OK, thank you. You're Captain Scala. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. Well, we'll, you know, we'll send you a mug and all that kind of oh, stuff. Well, well that will be, look beautiful in my new workplace. What a lovely email from Barbara there. It was. Um, I heard about this on Saturday morning. Yes. And I was quite surprised. Did, so she didn't ask you whether she could send the email or not? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, look, it's, it, it's a very lovely email, so it's very nice to speak to you. So when you, uh, when you were made redundant, beginning of February, that must, have, that must have been, as Barbara says, a very worrying time. Well, very, very, very shocking. They usually say it's around Christmas time, and I suppose they waited at least a month after Christmas. Yes. So, uh, but, you, but you, you stayed upbeat. Is that your... You're gen- you sound like an upbeat kind of person. Oh, well, you kind of have to, I guess, I've got to thank my mum for how great I am at being able to just get on with things. So you're presented with an issue, you've got to get on and get and get done. So to be honest, yeah. she should be captain, really. <laughs> well, well, she, well, you can share it if you want. You can share <laughs> the mug. When she comes round, you can share the mug. Oh, she's here. <laughs> oh, she's there. Okay, excellent. So, uh, and what are the names of, the, uh, of your children? Oh, Tom and Phoebe. So, and how old are they? Uh, eight and seven. Okay, so you kind of didn't really have much choice. You know, you had to stay bright and upbeat with them. Absolutely, yeah. And just kind of business as usual, make sure they're not aware of any worries or anything that goes on. Yeah. So you, were, so you send out the CV? <laughs> I did. Well, I was saying to your producer just now, actually, that I've been through half a dozen interviews over the last couple of weeks, and this is most, more nerve-wracking <laughs> oh really? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, so what kind of job were you applying for? I'm actually a health and safety environmental manager. Okay. So, so we go. So let's spool back to last week then. So this oh. time, this time last week, yeah, you're in the car. I am. And what happened? Literally 20 minutes after I left, I had been there for about three hours, I think. So 20 minutes after I left, I have a phone call just saying, "Well, we'd really like to offer you the job." And wow. Thankfully, I'd pulled over at that point because I'd been a little bit horrible to my children, so I was bribing them with chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of bribery is a, is essential parenting tool. Always. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> d- d- so, did you feel as though the interview had gone well? Oh yes, yes, I did. It was my second interview with them, so I'd had an interview the previous week and and uh, with the operations director, and then last week I had the interview with the CEO, and yes, she was such a lovely, normal person. It was, it was quite delightful, and the company are really amazing. Okay, well, I think we should probably mention them. Who are they? Uh, they're Lionel Hitchin Limited, and they're based in Barton Stacey. All right, and, and what, is your, what is your title? Uh, I'm Health, Safety and Environmental Manager. And when do you start? I start on the 8th of April. And, and how ecstatic are you? <laughs> Oh, I am so relieved and just, yeah, I, I can't believe that I have actually found something that I'm with a company that I, I'm so looking forward yeah. to joining. So, so, so one call can be really devastating and then another phone call oh. can, can solve almost everything. I, absolutely, absolutely. So did Tom and Phoebe get extra amounts of chocolate as a oh result of that? <laughs> they really did. <laughs> okay. Well, look, it's, uh, it's fantastic to speak to you and, and so happy that you, uh, that you got this great job. Hopefully they'll let you listen to a bit of Scala when you oh. start your new work. Well, if they don't now, I'm sure they will do in the very near future. I'm sure you can demand terms. <laughs> I, I've still got to sign my contract, so absolutely, I'll put it in there. So now, tell, so your mum, uh, Barbara, suggested um, Here Comes the Sun uh, as a piece of music to play. So just explain, explain what the thinking is here. Well, my mum, um, well, when I was little, I mean, it's not this particular song, but when I was little, my mum used to sing to me, um, uh, You Are My Sunshine. Yeah. Um, and I remember that, and I've been singing it to my daughter. Um, and then Here Comes the Sun has been on my playlist for ages. And when mum told me about this on Saturday, and she let me know about the piece of music that she had found that would be suitable for your show as well, we both listened to it and we just thought it was absolutely yeah. beautiful. Well, it's, Yo- um, it's Yo-Yo Ma on cello and James Taylor doing some vocals. Mm, it is. It's just absolutely beautiful. All right. Well, well, we'll play it for you and we'll play it for your mum. And Gemma Loftus from Salisbury, <laughs> mother of Tom and Phoebe, daughter of Barbara, you are Captain Scarlet for the day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well done, you, says Captain Scarlet.
would your followers now be called the Listerons? Well, it's it's a thought, Trevor. Let's see if it catches on. Captain Scala will be back next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If you know someone who really, really deserves an acknowledgement, a round of applause for a, a small achievement, a big achievement, anything that you think... Uh, someone gets to have the mug and someone gets to be indestructible for the day let us know please you email simon at scarlaradio.co.uk captain scarla back next week confessions monday and friday and you get your big friday weekend confession coming next your friday confession that's what's happening here don't forget if you've got a confession and let's be honest you've got a few now is the time to tell us uh it's confessions at scarlaradio.co.uk over the weekend you know that thing, you know that story that you want to tell us? You can change the names, you can make it as vague as you like, but we would love to hear your story. And you send it on the email, confessions at scarlaradio.co.uk. Then you're judged by the very judgy Judy. Uh, judge <laughs> Jody. Judge Whoa, Jody. Simon, judge Jody. That's a whole new idea. We've known each other for like a month now. I know, I should have I'm known offended. <laughs> but judge, judge Jody. Judge Jody is good. <laughs> judge Jack is, uh, is also good. got a very busy day <laughs> teaching everyone... All, all, all the Muppets here playing no, piano. No, no, you're, you're being too harsh to yourself. It will be fine. Don't panic. You haven't heard. <laughs> My hands are too small. True. That's all right. Uh, we can stretch them. It's no. like hand yoga. Uh, that, that is not a thing. You could never be a goalie with hands like that. No, that's true. That's a, but <laughs> is, are, are we going to do one of those days as well? <laughs> Have a you, net in the corner. You teach all your presenters yeah. to be goalkeepers <laughs> sports day anyway. yeah, I, was gonna say, I can't help with that I'm afraid so we got Judge Jack Judge Jody and Rick Radio in uh, sitting in judgement on today's tale which comes from John T in Derbyshire mm-hmm. alright John T Simon in the Forgiveness Forum I've been inspired by a couple of school themed confessions that were on your show to write in a school based tale of my own mine is slightly unusual confession in that I'm only indirectly involved in proceedings oh yeah However, I nevertheless feel it's a tale which now needs to be told 30 years on. Back in 1989, I was in the first year of studying for my GCSEs, fourth year of secondary school in Old Money, or Year 10 today, at a gritty northern comprehensive school on the outskirts of Doncaster. One of my chosen subjects was GCSE drama, under the stern tutelage of the school's drama teacher, the indomitable Mrs. Stagey McStageface, who... (laughs) Famously, you can change the names. You can change the names. Do you think that has been changed? I, it's almost... <laughs> There's somebody not. very offended right <laughs> yeah. now listening. That's my name. Who <laughs> famously used to stride throughout the school in her trademark high-heeled shoes at a pace that would have shamed Usain Bolt. During our first year of GCSE drama, the class put on a production of Pinocchio, which we successfully took on tour, performing it at several nearby primary schools. Buoyed by this success, Mrs. Stagey McStageface decided to celebrate the end of term by putting on an additional evening performance of the play for our parents. This was to be held in our own school's drama studio, a well-equipped but fairly compact building, festooned with stage lights in the ceiling and assorted drapes and curtains around the walls. To mark the point in the play where a block of wood was miraculously transformed into the actress playing the part of Pinocchio, our production incorporated one of those theatrical pyrotechnic smoke bombs. Ah, now we're getting to the heart of it. (laughs) Secreted in one of those galvanised metal mop buckets, beloved of school caretakers everywhere, this battery-operated device emitted a suitably dramatic bang and a generous puff of smoke at the appropriate point in proceedings to convey the desired magical moment. Despite the control of said device, having foolishly been given to a lad who, how can I put this, excelled at rugby, but little else during his second (laughs) school career, the effect had worked surprisingly well. Come the night of the final evening performance, lots of parents were squeezed into the small drama studio and the play was going well. Aside from the sound of muffled, but nevertheless increasingly noticeable, occasional giggles and shuffling from behind the aforementioned drapes around the walls of the studio. I should explain that due to the studio's compact size, there wasn't a space for a proper proper backstage area. Hence, actors and others involved had to hide behind the drapes when not on stage. This behind-the-scenes giggling and shuffling, occasioned I later discovered from several of those large bottles of strong lemonade having been smuggled backstage, became increasingly obvious for where I was sitting out front, where I was operating sound effects for the play. Until suddenly, an especially noticeable shuffle and a very loud giggle from behind the drapes caused the smoke bomb at a completely inappropriate point of the performance to be accidentally triggered. (laughs) 
Boom! <laughs> Went the smoke bomb. Actually, I think the bucket had been loaded with several smoke bombs. Now I look back. And the most enormous cloud of smoke funneled out of the mop bucket, bringing to mind one of those 1950s nuclear tests in the South Pacific. <laughs> Topical reference. The audience almost jumped out, well, literally jumped out of their seats and then began spluttering furiously as the smoke spread rapidly around the low-ceilinged room. From the audience's point of view, the stage completely disappeared. From the stage's point of view, the audience completely disappeared. Visibility <laughs> was down to zero. Many sensitive folk made for the door handkerchiefs over their faces, a coffin and a spluttering. <laughs> if the performance wasn't already in danger of degenerating into a bit of a farce, the appearance on stage of Mr. Geppetto just moments later <laughs> sealed its fate. Hands jauntily on hips, he slowly gazed around the drama studio at the thick smoke still lingering around the lights and said, My, but it's a foggy day this morning. <laughs> in a chirpy manner. I don't know if he spoke like that. Anyway, says Jaunty from Derbyshire, I don't need forgiveness from the backstage miscreants who caused this fiasco. They surely got what they deserved when Mrs. Stagey McStageface administered a right royal rollicking. I can still hear the heart-stopping sound of her heels clacking down the corridor as she angrily strode to the dressing rooms afterwards, giving silent thanks that I wasn't involved, says John T. <laughs> but rather from the parents, who must have had the fright of their lives and possible damage from smoke inhalation as they tried to make a rapid exit from our drama studio. Uh... <laughs> Backstage at school, lots of confessions, always. Mm -hmm. We had a few backstage mm -hmm. confessions yeah. mm -hmm. at Worthing Sixth Form College, let me tell you. Oh, mm -hmm. we're going to have to hear Oh, those. we're intrigued now. Yeah. Well, there was the French assistant and there was the woodwork <laughs> teacher who had to pretend for the purposes of the play that they were getting together. But by the end of the run... They were kind of together anyway. Oh. Juicy. That's, oh. that's <laughs> the, the magic of drama. Or was the drama a cover? They were together anyway. No, it no, was no. all a ruse. It was method acting. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. if you have a, maybe that's provoked a tale and you'd like to send it to me, uh, confessions at scholarradio.co.uk. But Judge Jody goes first. Um, I think, John T, with the performance, your teacher was trying to do a nice thing, stagey mixed stage face, and putting on the final performance. And it could have all gone wrong. But Mr. Chipotto, is that his name? Chipetto. Chipetto. He adjusted really well to the mishap and I think the humour of it's a rather foggy day, isn't it? Kind of showed that they could adjust uh -huh. maybe true amateur dramatics. It so was Amdram, Amdram confessions, I love them. I'm so going to forgive. All right. Judge Jack. See, it brought to mind my school nativity play when we were in primary school, and uh, I, I, they they ran out of roles, so we had a we had a, a godly role in several angels, and I was given a white wig uh, to play said role of God. Uh, of there, there was, no, no. Well, no, I, do, I didn't have any lines. I just occasionally applauded when good things happened, but I applauded at the wrong time. So it was supposed to be the deep and meaningful silent moment where everybody leans forward in their seats. And there I was applauding. So, you know, I, I think that I, I have created problems at performances myself as well through doing the wrong thing so i i think i can forgive there yeah rick radio wow geez i'm just thinking jack you're going to be teaching simon piano in a minute this is going to go so wrong <laughs> it is um, yeah. correct clapping um, I, I, in the past. I've, I've got i've got a son who's studied drama so i've seen many many performances and some of them has been as anarchic as this and the buzz you get as a parent when <laughs> it it all starts going wrong is fantastic so and therefore this, this ended up being like a ramstein gig um conf i totally forget is that the first time Ramstein being mentioned on the <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, okay, it's the, uh, if you want to uh, have your say and do the people's verdict on Jonty's confession, you can text to 64100. First word has to be Scarlet. <laughs> 